come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie review podcast that comes your way every Saturday, whether the world is ending or not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> These are the Pretty internet much. radio superstars. Holly. Sean. <laughs> Sean. Oh, there you go. Uh, so Who we, are you? Uh, I'm Colin. Again. That's three weeks in a row. Three weeks. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. It's the whole adapting to new technology thing. Um, so uh, what we do every week, we watch a movie that's chosen Ron Robin by the group. And uh, then we talk about it for a little bit. Uh, you can join in the uh, excitement by following along with us on social media. We'll tell you about that later. We'll tell you how you can uh, write in to Igor's mailbag and have him bring out the mail. But wherever you found us, we'd appreciate it if you give us a like, a star rating, or a review. All that stuff helps us get found by other folks like you in our quest for total world domination. Uh, so this week we watched a movie that was chosen by... Sean, what did we watch this week? Uh, 1997's The Relic. <clears throat> directed directed by, by Peter Hyam. Who we would know from? Time Cop. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. Stay Tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Which I haven't seen in years, but holy shit, I want to watch that again. End of Days. Yeah. Uh, oh, he, he did Amazing Stories. I did 2010. Yeah, well, wait, you said Amazing Stories, in two th- but the movie 2010, right? Yes, the movie 2010. The sequel to 2001. This is like, yes. I think there are, there are, well, there are three people, there's two peop- two directors huh. who have done sequels to Stanley Kubrick movies, right? Yes. They had the mm-hmm. hubris to say that they could follow <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. There's so I could do that. Peter Hyams with 2010, mm-hmm. and... Um, Oh, shit. Mike Flanagan. Mike Flanagan. I was going to say. With Dr. Sleep. And I suppose you could maybe put Mick Garris in there because he did a remake of The Shining. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yeah. Steven Weber, right? Yeah, that yeah. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ugh. But Peter Hyams, he, uh, that guy, he's actually from Chicago, which is going to come into play as we talk about the relic. He was, uh, uh, he was actually an anchor for like a TV station. In Chicago, right. then uh, went off to become, a, you know, he said, I want to get into movies. And I think his big, like, he had done it several, but the one that uh, that people remembered him for in the 70s was a movie called Capricorn One. You guys heard of that? No. I've heard of it, but I don't know anything about it. It's like a thriller where they fake a Mars landing, right? Ooh. And then the ship that they actually sent, because they're like, you can't actually survive that trip so we're going to take you off and you're going to shoot all this stuff behind the scenes like you're on mars but the ship when it comes back burns up and so they're like well then what happens to the guys it's james brolin is in it, elliot gould and uh well that's yeah. another connection he has to kubrick <laughs> then is faking a planetary landing oh, there it is no shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah now's not the time michaela <laughs> <laughs> well he also did uh, a movie actually i think my favorite of his movies you guys ever seen outland with Sean Connery? No. No, I don't think so. It's like High Noon on Jupiter's Moon. Um, <laughs> but yeah, then, is that the tagline? It's very, it's very <laughs> that it should be. I think that might be the tagline, yeah. It's High Noon on Jupiter's Moon. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good movie. And then um, I know he did Running Scared. That was another Chicago set movie because yeah. I think that was one I of the first. I like that movie, actually. Yeah. No, wait. We're talking about the, the old one with the Billy. 80. Not the Paul Walker one? No, the Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines one. Okay. Yeah, I like the Paul Walker one, too, yeah. The Paul Walker one's really good. Gregory Mm -hmm. Hines. Remember when he was in shit? Yeah, yeah. Wolfen. White Knights. Yeah, okay. Um, (laughs) um, And yeah, End of Days. End of Days, you know, when I was watching The Relic, I'm like, oh, I remember, like, he took that same visual aesthetic into yeah. end of days and that's why i don't i don't think uh that movie i, I can't remember seeing a whole lot of it uh, yeah complete darkness that's not hard <laughs> to take from one movie to another <laughs> yeah all right so what uh so um so what's the relic about uh why don't we set this movie up for the folks at home 
Uh, I mean, we start out uh, in where is he? The Amazon? I'm, I'm gonna uh, <coughs> Brazil. He's in Brazil yeah. or oh, Brazil, something. Brazil, right, right. He's in Brazil, and uh, our uh, scientist John Whitney uh, is studying a tribe out there, and they give him. They concoct a cocktail for him to drink, and he drinks it, because why wouldn't you? No, you're not supposed be, to do it. When somebody hands to be, you something become to become part of the tribe. Yep. Oh, well. Everything I watch <laughs> on TV now where two people just get close to each other is freaky, so mm -hmm. here, drink this thing that the tribe made. I'm sure you'll be fine. Like, you're going to trip balls off of whatever they give you, right? <laughs> like, yeah, that's just what's going to happen. Least. At the very least. Uh, and so yeah. that's basically what starts to happen to him. He starts tripping... Um, one of the tribesmen dressed up as a monster, uh, the, I'm guessing the, the Kathoga, um, comes up to him and scares him and he screams and then it's just like, whoosh, the relic. This and is then, the title uh, you're saying, yeah. Yeah, this is the cold open. Yeah, because it um, turns out that you need to remember the name John Whitney, uh, because this becomes yes. extremely, yeah. uh, important as the movie goes on. But I don't think I caught that the first time that I saw this movie that I was supposed oh, no, to be. no, I had to have it explained to me. <laughs> Because you don't know that you're supposed to be investing this much attention in a pre-title sequence. Right. Right. Yeah. I agree. First time I saw it, I didn't connect the guy at the beginning with whatever else was going on in the movie. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until later that that was made clear. Though I did see this as a kid. <clears throat> well, that explains a whole lot. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> I feel like I would have loved this movie if I had seen it as a kid. Oh, you would have. Yeah, you would have been like, that yeah. was Everything. Like, like the, this was a big HBO uh, staple for for uh -huh. a long time. Yeah. Well, that's HBO what I was. First I was kind of wondering about this because, like, I never hear anyone talking about the relic in like. There's never any references to it in other pop culture. You know what I mean? But it seems no, like never. everyone has fucking seen the movie. Mm -hmm. You're saying that's yes. why. I th uh, probably no one's going to be like, "Hey guys, you remember this movie?" Because everyone's like, "Yeah, the relic. We've all seen it." You don't talk about things that every single person has seen. Well, it's weird. I feel like the other Field Museum movie, The Prophecy, gets talked about way more than The Relic. Now, which one is which one is that? The Prophecy from '79. Yeah, they're not like, in a Field Museum in that prophecy? one. Yeah, they're, see, they, they're, it's supposed to take place in the Field Museum, though. Uh, what in a novel or something? Because that one actually takes place in like the Pacific Northwest or something. They're outdoors in the woods the whole way through that one. But that's why I was wondering when you were asking about that. I'm like the Christopher Walken one or the no, no. yeah. Well, this one I think. Uh, so the the relic is based on a novel. Did you look this up, Sean? Did you find yeah. out all the all the relevant info about this? What uh, what's uh? Well, I mean, what can you tell us about the book? It was a book. It's called The Relic uh, by two authors. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's, it's all basically the same story. Um, a lot of characters were uh, combined for the movie. Um, and some deaths were changed because um, characters in the book go on to come back in the sequel book. There's a sequel book to this. What's that one called? Um, uh, the Relic... Uh, the Reliquary. The Reliquary, that's yeah. it. Yep. <clears throat> The place where you store it, the holy relic, right? Yeah. Which is, which is, uh, I think it gets into uh, Michaela's favorite thing is that there were, there's another monster, <laughs> like there's, there was two the whole time, <laughs> <laughs> and they're going through the sewers under. It's New York in the book, and so they're chasing another creature under the sewers. I was very in New York. concerned this movie was going to do that. Not going to lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does go in the sewers mm -hmm. for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but I was worried there was going to be a second one. Oh, <laughs> I was I like, really it's gonna happen. Like, I don't, I don't think they'd quite tapped into that uh, uh, surprise, another monster thing yet. Because otherwise, it very well could have happened. For right, that was the next year when Godzilla 1998 came out, right? Uh, yeah, there's baby ones, <laughs> right? I don't see why they should have. Uh, well, then what are we talking one? about? Jaws well, 3D wait, did it Anaconda way back in the, the same year. Was it? Yeah, yeah, Anaconda right. Yeah, is the same yeah. year, and that does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they were they were just right on the cusp there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, apparently the book, uh, the movie Excise is a character from the novels whose name is uh, Aloysius Pendergrass, Pendergrass uh, which Aloysius. is an FBI agent who I think becomes the main character of the novel and has spawned like this whole series of novels. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's he's always got to be one of these like extremely weird, eccentric, uh, supernaturally inclined 
FBI guys, right? And he yeah. becomes your protagonist. Um, but they cut him out completely from this, which is like, how do you do that? I mean, you just take the main character out. <laughs> Give it all to Tom Sizemore. <laughs> yeah, who's in this? <clears throat> Tom Sizemore, Penelope Ann Miller, uh, Linda Hunt. Um, 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 we have a little bit of James, oh, James Whitmore in did there. Anyone else, did anyone else remember that Penelope Ann Miller and Linda Hunt were both in Kindergarten Cop? Yes. Yes, a lot of people were, yeah. as a matter of yeah. fact. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a, uh, a spiritual sequel to Kindergarten Cop. Yeah, it really which, is. <laughs> which... Uh, I would love if Schwarzenegger just showed up at the end would have been great. Yeah, you just call it Kindergarten Cop 2, the field trip. <laughs> yeah. Right? And you stick with those kids a little more. Yeah. 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 There, there but there is. is there is a Kindergarten Cop 2 starring Dolph Lundgren. Oh, Jesus, there is. That's right. They just came out, didn't it? That's like that's a only a couple ago, years yeah. old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the bulk of this movie takes place in the Chicago uh, Museum of Natural History. Is it the Field Museum? It's in, field right? Museum. Or is it? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's the maybe first and only time, certainly the biggest showcase for uh, the Chicago Museum. So I think, you know, if you're living in the Midwest, if you're in that area, there's a certain attachment you have to the relic because it showcases at least. That's why I loved it. (laughs) Yeah. I knew it was in Chicago. I'm just like, hey, that's like right down the street. They shot a movie there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's all it took to make child me excited. Once I remember meeting someone who was in the movie, like during the big gala scene, you know, she came in, you know, wearing a dress or something. I was like, oh, yeah, I was in the movie. And I remember being at the Field Museum, uh, I think when they, I'm not saying they were shooting when I was there, but I remember those superstition banners hanging up outside. So it's like somehow they had dressed it for it. But um, um so the but the whole thing here, okay. So we got to get from the the rainforest to uh, the field museum, and mm-hmm. there's a scene which I shipping was shipping crates, Colin. Yeah, I wasn't shipping. sure what was going on movie. there. Yes, it is a crate movie. <laughs> there's a lot of them. We determined mm. a lot of crate movies or a yes. lot of crates in this movie. Like it starts with with a big crate being lifted off of a ship. <laughs> <laughs> which was a thing in the a- 90s, which you don't really seem to see a whole lot anymore. Uh, Wishmaster had the best version of this, right? Yes, it did. <laughs> Where a guy gets smushed Just by Just go watch crate. it. I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> oh, sorry. And then, uh, yeah, oh, there's always, you know, something, the, um, you know, the ship comes in. It's like Dracula, right? I suppose the, the, mm-hmm. the ship comes from a foreign land and it brings the horror with it and then, you know, runs rampant on, in your city. Um, yep. But I didn't, okay, so you guys maybe have to explain this to me. I mean, I guess maybe in hindsight, maybe I get it. But there's a scene before the ship departs from Brazil when it's heading back to the United States. We see a guy. Is that Whitney? That's John Whitney. After he's come down from his trip. Yes. And he's looking for something in those crates. He's still in Brazil at that point, and he's having stuff shipped home, stuff he's collected on his trip in Brazil. And so he's looking for... His crates, yes. Okay, but he doesn't find them because the crates aren't on the ship? Like, we see okay, later... The, apparently. I didn't get what the hell was going... Like, they were five yeah, minutes into the movie, and I'm like, I am not sure what's happening. No, his crates were not on the ship, but he ended up on the ship. Even though the crates were, like, sitting on the dock right next to the ship, somehow they did not get shipped. Right. Okay. And there's a line of dialogue later that says something happened, and they were delayed three weeks, and they just got here. Okay. Which is why they're in his office. Okay. So what we're supposed to believe here is that... Uh, so Well, okay, so then the action shifts to uh, the Chicago Museum, uh, where... Well, first it shifts to the boat and um, Tom Sizemore. Oh, that's right, because we have the scene where, like, the, mis- the mystery ghost ship shows up. Right. This is one of those things, like, I live in this area and all my life have never known about the St. Lawrence Seaway. Did you know about this? What is this? Nope. That's what I'm saying. So they reference it in the movie, and I was like, because I'm sitting there going like, okay, this uh, thing came from Brazil, and it ended up in Lake Michigan, a ghost ship without a pilot. Like, how does that happen? And so Sizemore says something about the seaway, and I'm like, okay, I got to Google this. Like, right now, what the fuck are we talking about? There is a thing called the St. Lawrence Seaway, which starts up in Canada above Maine. And leads down and connects through all the Great Lakes. Really? 
There you go. Yeah. London unknown. Hitherto unknown. Hitherto unknown. Hitherto unknown. You, Colin, you, teaching <laughs> geography lesson. <laughs> you can get to the ocean from Chicago. Yeah, I didn't know you were shipping magnate. <laughs> Well, it's because I was like sitting there going like, this movie's got a giant problem right now. <laughs> and I can't figure out how the fuck it ends up. Right. I'm like, okay. So somehow, I mean, when you look at the chart, you're like, okay, it never would have made it, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the ship shows up. It's very spooky and mysterious. And top cop, Tom Sizemore, is called in to... Vincent uh, Augusta. That's right. So Tom Sizemore is an actor of uh, some renown and some infamy, I think, uh, renowned because I think the relic was his first leading role. If I remember, I so. what did he, what did he done before that? I can't tell if nobody can hear me. No, I can hear you. I'm just, uh, <laughs> Sean just doesn't know. Yeah. I, wait, hold on. Hold on. I have it pulled up. I'm actually right, right on his page. Heat. Yes. Uh, Devil in a blue dress, strange days, natural born killers, Striking Distance, True Romance, Heart and Souls, <clears throat> Passenger 57, mm, my favorite. Now, most people uh, probably know him from Saving Private Ryan. Point Break, Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, he, like we said, he'd done every war movie ever. For for 10 years, he was pretty much in all of them. Well, uh, would it yep, surprise you to know that the keeper of the Saturday Night, Hall, the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame, MF Mad, Says that Tom Sizemore has been planted on our wall. Now we're going to have to cut out a picture of him and mount it, put it on the wall behind us, joining the galaxy of other stars on the Sylvester Stallone and Jeffrey Combs Wall of Fame. <laughs> Can we give the wall a very long name? Like Just the keep Saturday it. Night like, Freak like Show Like the Office wall Fun of Run? Just like uh, <laughs> the Sylvester Stallone Honorary uh, uh, March 22nd Wall of... Just keep going with it. I just got to have a plaque. Yes, something. with all the names. Well, Sizemore was in movies that we've covered on this show. We did Point Break way back in the day, uh, True Romance. We also did Now the Relic. So that has planted him firmly on the wall frame. A little round of applause for uh, <laughs> Tom Sizemore. Tom Sizemore, also famous, infamous for his behavior. Drugs. <laughs> celebrity rehab. Drugs. <laughs> yeah, celebrity rehab. Because wasn't he, was he married or was he dating... Um, the Hollywood madam, Heidi Fleiss. I think they were together for a long time. And they ended up on that show together, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was dark television, man. Yeah. Did, I probably anyone, shouldn't have watched that at the age I was watching it. <laughs> did anyone play Tom Sizemore in the Heidi Fleiss movie that they made? Oh, I'm sure. Uh, I wonder who. <laughs> <laughs> who would you like, cast, Sean? Who, who would you cast as Tom Sizemore? Well, Liam Bruce Willis. No. I think Liam Shriver is a good one. They have okay, the same Shriver. profile. Yeah. Be good. Good if, you, if you got like gaunt and made his head ten times bigger, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, the reason that Bruce well, Willis came to my withered mind... withered and drug-addled now. Yeah. Yeah, now he's all... Yeah. Well, the reason Bruce Willis came to my mind is because it seemed to me, and I don't know, like once I got hooked onto this, like while we were watching the movie, I like couldn't let it go. There was a diehard aesthetic, I think, to the cinematography, which is also done by the director. Peter Hyams is his own cinematographer in all of his movies, and he loves, long before J.J. Abrams embraced the lens flare, Peter Hyams loves the fuck out of those lens flares. Anamorphic yeah. widescreen lens flares. Like John I don't McKinnon think he had did. a choice. They were the only lights in the movie. <laughs> right? Right? If you just have floodlights and darkness, you're going to get a lens flare. It is a very unusual aesthetic to go with. Um, it's, the, it's the 90s. Did you? Well, yeah, okay. Because you're saying stuff like uh, Seven or the X-Files or those kind of, hey, we're all going to go dark and, you know. Yeah, we're always, I mean, it was that and the movie takes place in basements and sewers, but it's just like every movie is just like, all right, we're in a basement. Basements are dark and drippy. And that's what we're going to make it look like. That's the nineties. The thing is when you do that in a creature movie that like tells the audience, or at least is how I take it is that like, we don't have confidence in our, the design of our creature. Yeah. yeah you're trying to hide it in darkness, mm -hmm. but sometimes mm -hmm. that works, you know, Sometimes it works because, you know, you, the bits and pieces that you see. The, the original Alien was kind of like that. I mean, compared to other movies of that time, it was fairly dark. But at least the cinematographer there knew what the hell he was doing. I mean, Hyams is a, 
you know, I mean, he's been a cinematographer for like, what, 30, 40 years. You know, I mean, he knows what he's doing. So this is a, like a, an aesthetic choice. But the only way yeah. that I can describe it to you at home is um, it, it, the every shot embraces a silhouette. The backgrounds always seem to be lit just a bit brighter than the, the subject in the front, foreground. Yeah, there's no key lighting in this. Uh-uh. Yeah, that's the other thing that was missing, right? Like, you, you would just have a single light source, which sometimes would be like a flashlight or a single yeah. bulb light somewhere, and there'd be no key light on the back of the actor's head to separate them from the darkness. And it, I don't know, I mean, I mean, I thought it was an, a very ugly-looking movie because of that, but I mean... It's very drab. So you're saying, I mean, like, what's the psychological effect of this on you when you watch it? I mean, did you think that this was a quality big budget movie or it was a low budget movie or? I think it reads as a cinematographer finally getting to do what he's always wanted to do instead of what the, instead of what the director is telling him. So he's just going to try weird things. I mean, I suppose it's a thing to go like, hey, I'm going to make my movie completely black <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe he choice. just wants it. Maybe he just wants uh, like tons of shadow because he's like the monster can come from anywhere. It's a horror movie. Yeah. I shoot my horror movies. I shoot them in the dark. Damn it. Yeah. So many lens flares. I, mean, I have it on I, right now, and I'm just like I'm blinded by the flare. I guess I just don't understand how at no point did anyone be like, I can't see a fucking thing in this movie. <laughs> like, how are they like? Okay, that's fine. We can release it that way. It's fine. Like you can't see anything in this movie. It does look unfinished, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. As in, you're saying it's missing a couple other light sources, or what do you mean? Yeah, it it feels like like here's a here's a rough shoot we're gonna do just to make sure this is gonna work, and like they release that as the movie, like a rough cut. Well, I mean, when you're saying, uh, you know, Holly, when you're saying that, you know, it's like, when did somebody step in and go, you know? hey, I can't see anything, you figure like, okay, well, your cinematographer is your director, so director's making those decisions, but I imagine that, like, dailies are going back to the studio. Right. That's what right. I mean. No no one is coming back and saying, yeah, I like what you're doing, but I can't see a fucking thing. <laughs> Do you think at that point in time we were just so used to watching, like, blown-out VHSs that we're like, oh, I can, like, make out something that's good enough? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I know I'm from being an audience member back then. I mean, I saw this opening night or whatever, and I remember even then going like, this is underlit. You know, I mean, like, you know, I can't see what the fuck is going on because his his other uh, the other way that he shoots it is uh, with a lot of uh, extreme close ups. Right. So you're you're Mm -hmm. right up on somebody from, you know, about their eyebrows to their lips. Right. And then yeah. he'll have the light sources because he's trying to make some kind of frantic, um, you know, like it's really spooky and there's shit going on. So the light is always swaying. So you're getting these like reflections hitting their face and they go in the dark, hitting their face in the dark. And you're like, I can't when you cut away from that to the next shot. I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> right, right. I can't make out a shape here to be like, OK, this is, you know, but yeah, I don't know. It's a it's an interesting uh, but I don't know if that's a successful way of, you know. I don't I think also, so. I think it's distracting. Yeah, and I think it. I think it made the field museum look bad. I agree. Like it made yeah. it look really ugly, and that is not an ugly museum. And actually, it's a really well lit museum normally. Yeah, when they were at the gala, I was looking. Around, I was like, first of all, this is the dimmest gala I've ever seen in my life. Like, no mm-hmm. one can even see each other. And then it made the museum. I was like, the museum looks cheap. The mm-hmm. field museum. Mm-hmm. Looks cheap. How is that possible? Well, and like the Field Museum has those just constant, like I call it like the Westworld area where like it's just uh, the rows and rows and rows of animals and glass boxes that are well lit that like they glow almost. Mm. It's like they turned all of those off in the whole right. museum. Yeah, because they were trying to be moody because we're making yes. a horror movie and this is how you make a horror movie in the dark. All right. Well, uh, well, we'll Monsters try, belong in the dark. Colin. We'll try and tell you, listener, what we saw in the movie as we go here. But so, uh, Penelope Ann Miller is in the movie. <laughs> she is a cheap laugh. Cheap laugh. Colin. Sorry, uh, that was a shout out to Club. Dr- Nobody saw Club Dread, one of the greatest slasher comedies. We all saw it. We <laughs> have it in a long time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say we all saw it that once, and then nobody ever went back. To it. <laughs> uh, um. 
So Pink she's from because uh, she was in like Carlito's way, like around it. Was that yeah. like her big, you know? Yeah, I remember her. She was in other people's money and stuff like that. Um, so she plays a um, Dr. Green. Yeah, but her field of study is evolutionary biology. Yeah. Right, which I yeah, mean, DNA uh, and shit. It's appropriate to be in this movie. And uh, she is on the receiving end of these crates that were shipped over from Brazil. And mm. inside the crates, they find um, just a bunch of packing leaves, and there appears to be a fungus on these leaves, and the fungus might be um, eggs, right? Yeah. And around this exact same time, there's a murder that happens in the the bowels of the field museum a guard is beheaded right torn apart yes so uh, so, so the, many beheadings so this movie is trying to set up i mean i suppose this is um you know, so this is like it's like it's an alien right for the most well, part what do we think is happening at this point like do we do you think I, it's a serial killer we don't know it's a monster until like the security guard dies because we see a, a giant hand claw come out and grab his leg and pull him away. Yeah. And then uh, there's an awesome scene with uh, probably, I don't know, it might have been my favorite scene in the movie with a coroner. <laughs> She's great. <laughs> the sassy great. coroner. In the coroner. There's always a sassy coroner. She wasn't eating, though. I was going to say she wasn't eating a sandwich. <laughs> she wasn't eating, but she was sassy, so that makes up for it. Well, what does she find? What's, what's odd about this murder? His brain is light, even for uh, a male, says she. Um, he's missing his hypothalamus. <laughs> there you go. It's been uh, torn out, eaten out. We don't know. This is very strange. This ties strange. into, I think, there are bodies discovered on this ship, right? Which also yep. suffer the same, had suffered the same fate. Uh, but Tom Sizemore is working under the idea that it's a uh, like a drug gang you know, killed everybody on the ship, and now they're after whatever was in these crates. And so, now this is, so I was trying to work this out, right? Because basically what's going to happen here is that the um, entire Chicago police force is going to descend on the Field Museum, right? And lock it down. Well, they're not really locking it, but they're searching it from top to bottom. Yeah. On the hunt for who? Like, what What do they think is going on? <coughs> a seven-foot-tall serial killer, Colin, obviously. Who's still hiding in the museum. Somewhere, yeah. After, on, like, day two, right? This is, did this strike anybody else as bizarre? <laughs> I, bit, I had yeah. a hard time tracking time at all throughout this movie, so. Yeah, it feels like three days passes in this movie. Uh-huh. And she's in the basement the entire time. Who? Penelope Ann Miller. Well, there's also the, uh, I can't remember what she was, the restoration expert, who yes. is, uh, they just have these random cutaways, right, to this woman who has been given a, a piece of rock, and she's, you know, polishing the rock and br- brushing stuff off the rock and reassembling the rock until finally it's like, it's a little statue of a demon thing, and they keep cutting to her, like, over the course of the running time of the movie, where I was like, has she just been down there the whole time? I think that's one scene that they just cut up and like interspersed throughout the entire film. Well, probably. And then, so is is that is that rock thing that she's cleaning? Is that the relic? Technically, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is right. the that is the titular <laughs> the titular. Relic. Relic, you know, I'm glad yes. you said that because I never actually thought about what the title meant until now, and you made me question <laughs> everything for a minute there. It's like, wait, why is it called? That? You were just like, what's the relic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right okay but then my question is well, what the, the hell does kind of that have like, to do with anything else in the movie the it's kind of the, the relic <laughs> as well he's a relic from the like the past of this tribe that has come back but that now. was a part of the ceremony we saw i mean no <laughs> Just, there's a lot of things in this movie that happen that are completely inconsequential to the story yeah, well, it has a running time of almost two hours. I think it's about yes. ten minutes shy of two Insane. hours. Insane. There is a lot of... This is one of those movies where you kind of... So the movie is going to hold off, which I kind of do appreciate the patience of going like, we, we showed you that it is a monster movie, but we're going to hold off like an hour before we're actually going to sh- give you a, a look at our monster. But the way yes. it fills up that first hour 
is through like uh, the writers thoroughly scientific re- terminology. Yeah, where we have all you know because basically Penelope Ann Marshall or Marshall Penelope Ann Miller is <laughs> marshalling all of the scientific uh, community here in this in the, the the museum to try and decode the DNA that's found on these leaves. Because I think at some point it does create, like, another little monster, right? Yes. What happens there? Uh, there's, um, there's the, I forgot, the beetles that eat the flesh off bones <clears throat> they have in the museum. Um, apparently there's a, uh, a line of dialogue that says, like, a couple of them got loose. They broke out and went somewhere in the middle of the night. And so there's a cutaway where you see one of the tiny little bugs crawling onto the leaf with the fungus on it. And then she collects all of it, stuffs it in a container, and puts it in the fridge. And then probably the next day, again, time is loose in this movie. Um, the next day, she hears a bunch of uh, movement in the thing, opens it up, and the beetle is huge and, <laughs> and running at her. It looks like a smaller version of the bug from Starship Troopers. Yeah, it does. Basically. I, I love it squishes like it with that. a textbook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Did, did, you see, did you see how many beetles were in that tank? So... How did they know that a few got loose? Is it someone's job to count those every day? I'll bet. How will they? That is <laughs> it was a good the security question. guard's job, and now that he's decapitated, <laughs> no one's there to keep track anymore. Right? Yeah, they need a bug counting thousands. intern. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so this, uh, so okay, because the thing turns into a monster, I don't think she's told Sizemore of this yet. Sizemore arrives with the cops. They're going to search the place. I think actually this time I was actually paying attention to how many times, because I was keeping track of time through how many times I saw that woman cleaning that fucking statue. And it was two days. So the movie takes place over two days because the first night is when the guard is killed and the two kids who like, this is another like dead end fucking plot point. Two kids sneak off a field trip and spend the night in the museum. And what happens to them? Nothing. In the book, they die. That would seem a logical outcome, which would have been welcome. But yeah, yeah. Like, come on, don't don't introduce kids in a movie like this and then not kill them. Yes. No, kill the children. Especially, especially with the cutaway, the way it the way it's set up, it looks like they're going to come back and find that the two kids have been murdered because that's when like all the cops are like rushing the building, and I'm like, oh, did they actually kill them? No, they didn't. No, two kids saw yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they did well, find the guy's decapitated <laughs> corpse. But then that, I mean, sure. like I said, the, the, the re- police response in Chicago based on this movie is so amazing. You want to live there because if anything happens, the entire city's police force is going to show up and investigate the shit out of it. And they're not leaving day. it's done. That's right. Uh, <laughs> the, it's, the mayor's coming, Colin. Okay. This is mm. very important. Big it's deal. a phone call after he kills a homeless man that this gala will go on. <laughs> That's right. I forgot. You're absolutely correct. It's because the Have you seen is coming. It? Have you seen his wife's cleavage? People need to see it, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> the cleavage got him elected. <laughs> and also the Braithwaite. That is the Chicago coming? mayor right there. Yeah. Harkens that's, back that's, to that's, yeah. Mayor Daly or something. I don't know who the hell it's trying to be. He, uh, I don't know either. <laughs> um, yeah, the show must go on, basically, is what the mayor's saying. And this is a big deal, and all the rich people are coming, and they're going to be donating money to the museum. The doctors need these grants. We've got doctors fighting for these grants. Pen- Penelope Ann Miller has to fight with this other guy named Greg. Riveting stuff. <laughs> but she also needs Greg's help to decode. Greg is, like, trying to smooge, uh, smooth, smooth. Schmooze. I like schmooze, whatever schmooze. word you just created. He's trying to schmooze with the the benefit the wealthy benefactors, right? And trying to weasel her out of a grant. I know this is riveting stuff for a, a horror mm. movie. Um, but so this comes down to the thing that they are talking about: what recombinant DNA and uh, RNA and watching computer you lost monitors me, as <laughs> they and uh, <laughs> and I'm out <laughs> and I'm out. Yep. <laughs> For a while, what do they learn? What is all this uh, uh, techno babble? Which sounds to me, I am prepared to buy it that they researched sure. it because it sounds authentic. But who and- cares? <laughs> because but they who, sound- could ca- who could possibly care? <laughs> because they sound like very excited nerds when they're saying this stuff. Yeah, exactly. So I believe them. Were you able to follow it? 
Nope. And I okay. honestly didn't care enough to, because yeah, I knew I, it wasn't going to be important. I got yeah. that the uh, the fungus on the leaves is full of hormones. Um, it's, it's I really got that they were testing tell. the DNA of stuff. It's really hard to tell in this movie what's going to be important and what's not. Right, because yeah. it's just, yeah, because it could just be a nerd getting exciting over something. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then it won't matter in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. It's a very strange uh, structure. For I mean, it, it did to me feel like, it's like, oh, this is clearly based on a novel, you know? Mm. <laughs> Where oh, <it's> like, absolutely. <laughs> we're putting right. all the well, research like, that the, the guy, the writer put in, into the movie. When we were watching last night, we were talking about it. I was like, is this like some weird subgenre of like archaeologist procedural movie? Like, <laughs> like, you know, police procedurals are really big with like crowds on TV, but movies is where you go for your ar- archaeologist procedural because it was so in the detail. Of mm-hmm. Very much. There were processes. Maybe this gave birth to Relic Hunter, the TV show that starred Tia Carrere. Remember that one? Oh, yeah, that popped yes. up when I was looking for this movie <laughs> yeah, <same. laughs> on Prime. That actually came up first. And, and I looked at them like, is that Tia Carrere? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I forgot about her. It was like the Tomb Raider knockoff, and then eventually you had the librarian. Was that the other one with uh, Noah Wy- Wiley? Noah Wiley, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the librarian, yeah. And then it was the librarians. They turned into a TV show. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, um, Fun. Well, she figures out, I think... Somehow, I'm not sure. You're going to have to maybe connect the dots here. Basically, there is a creature, and that B, it is drawn to the fungus. It needs to eat yes. the fungus because the fungus has a hormone that it needs to survive. Yes. And the fungus is also, if you don't have, give it the fungus, it can it's find that. Go for the next best thing, which is the hypothalamus. Boom. There you go. Which which is why there are 25 decapitations in this movie. <laughs> I don't think I'm kidding on that number. I don't Everyone think so. Everyone gets their head cut off. When was the first time that we actually see the creature, which has, it turns out, been living in the uh, bowels of the, the, the subterranean uh, sewer system, which right. I love this, too, because it's like beneath... The, you know, it's like Phantom of the Opera or something, right? Only in the modern day in <laughs> Chicago, beneath the Field Museum, there is this catacomb of gigantic fucking tunnels, right? <laughs> that lead under See? the entire city or whatever. This is cool shit. <laughs> I this is like, what I, I love. love the, I love how, you, how much you're romanticizing this movie by saying it's like a Phantom <laughs> of the Opera. Type. That really elevates it, Colin. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, that's but that's what I, occurred to me when I was like, oh, it's going to be one of those where you have the basement. Then the sub basement is like no one's been down here since they built these in the twenties or you know whatever the hell in fifty years yeah the, <laughs> the monsters down there playing an organ is that what <laughs> is that where we end up okay but here's the other thing that we uh, maybe we need to clarify that for the people at home who haven't seen this movie where we're talking about the beetle eats the thing and then grows into yes. like a giant beetle but the creature when we first see it this is on day one um, is full grown. So my question that I put full grown and asthmatic. How did it get there? How did it get into the museum? They explain it. They, the, he, he, the the from Lake Michigan, there is a tunnel system that will lead to the museum. <laughs> uh, perfect. Okay, I perfect. missed it. I, 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 what? What? <laughs> I missed it. There's the flaw, Colin. <laughs> All right. I don't understand your sarcasm. So the the creature was on the boat, killed everybody on the boat, jumped off into the water swam into the uh, tunnel, got to the museum because it knew, and we find out later that it does actually know that that's where the crates are going. Yes. Okay. I'm with you. I am totally up and ready to go on this movie. The crates are the most important thing in this movie. That's right. (laughs) Really are. Really are. So the monster is called the Cathoga. 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 Okay. Which means, I believe, son of the devil or son of Satan in some uh, tribes dialect, right? Is that sure. Word, right? And yep. uh, we do, at this point, probably midway through the movie, uh, we do actually get, like, a pretty good, like, full-on look at this beast. So what, right. this is uh, designed by, I don't know if it's designed by Stan Winston himself or his staff, but it's uh-huh. a Stan Winston. I'll bet it was. <clears throat> so what do we think of the monster, and can you describe it for the folks at home? It's awesome, first of yeah. all. Yeah, I like the monster. Monster's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, especially um, when it's practical. It's kind of like a death claw from Fallout, which is like 
it's got like it's like a big lizard type quadruped with like big kind of horns coming off its head and like but its jaws open like the predator. Mm-hmm. You know what it looks like? It looks like one of the predator dogs. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. shit. It now does. That, yeah. Now that I now that I think about it, it looks like one of the predator dogs. <laughs> yeah. Which it does. Which is disappointing now because the predator dogs are lame. But this was cool. <laughs> well, you know how I feel about that movie. Right. Well, which aren't there, aren't there aren't there pre- aren't there predator dogs in Predators and the Predator? Oh, I, I, I haven't seen the Predator. I went to I'm the a, Predator. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you're right. They were better in yeah. the uh, Predators. Yeah, and Predators. Pre- yeah. Predator. It looks like one of the Predators. Uh, predator dogs. Yeah. Okay. So it's a big yes. scaly monster. It's realized in the it's movie. It's got hair and a tail. Mm-hmm. And it's partially uh, computer generated, partially a practical thing. Like apparently a pretty big practical thing because there was a time when it fell through a skylight. And I'm like, that's a real. They, they actually dropped this thing through a skylight. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a real dealio. Which I think on IMDb, there's someone credited as the monster too. So I think there's someone like in a suit. Cool. Yeah, there were two yeah. guys in the. Uh, I was watching yeah. the, the end credits. Two guys as Kathoga. The yeah. monster. Um, I'll tell you this: the um, this movie does stand out in my mind for one very specific reason. When I first saw this, right in 1997, um, there's a scene where uh, the monster like is chasing a guy. So the guy's running toward the camera, and the monster's behind him, and the monster bites his head, and in one shot, cuts the guy. You know, bites the guy's head off. And yeah. I remember that moment because I'm like, this is what, what we can do in movies now. Because before then, you couldn't do it in one shot, right? You would have to do the cutaway. Monster grabs the guy's head. Then from another angle, monster tears the fake head off the, the dummy. But in this, it was like you couldn't see the seam. It was like, oh, my God. It just looked like it bit that guy's head off in one, one continuous <laughs> shot. I mean, I know now right. we do that all the time. But at that point in time, that was like, this is the first movie where I was able to see that actually happen. Yeah, where they can combine all that stuff. How do you think the uh, CG held up? <laughs> it's definitely worse than I thought, than I remember it being. Um, but still, I've seen way worse. Uh, yeah, it depends on what it's doing. Really. Yeah, it really yeah. does. When it's jumping, it's really bad. Yeah, when they shadow it more, it obviously looks better. But um, when it's running around on fire, ooh, that was I mean, that was I bad. That was, I, I thought that was. Uh, I think it's cool. It, obviously, it's bad. But I also think, like, anything run, anything on fire moving, like, you know, whether it's Christine or this monster, yeah, I give it a pass. It looks bad, but it's still cool. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look great. Yeah. Well, the monster gets to uh, come out to play on, because this is what the whole movie's kind of been heading for, is the big gala premiere when you pack, you know, uh, I don't know, a couple dozen people in uh, tuxedos and dresses into the room, into the, in the, the museum, and then bodies start falling out of the sky, and the mm-hmm. monster gets loose, and and, the, and your favorite thing happens, Colin. The power goes out. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. In, in, in fantastic fashion. And it will be that you couldn't even tell the lights were on to begin with. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, it was my favorite thing because I never like. You just don't go into a movie set in the Field Museum thinking that there's going to be guys at a control panel who can switch all those switches that close off and lock like the cell doors, you know, so yeah. like at this point we're locking it down and all the things go. And then That's when the, the power stuff. goes out, right, because I can't remember what shut the power off. I don't recall the plot device that actually led to the power going out. But then it's like a bunch of guys screaming in the dark in the control room. You know, it's like, oh, my God, the, the you know, whatever, this is locked down. The fire doors are about to close and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's this mass chaos. <laughs> and Hyams constructs it in a way where it's like he's cutting between three pieces of linear action, but cross-cutting between them. So you get about three seconds of scene A, which is people running. Three seconds of scene B, people freaking out. And three uh seconds of scene C, which is Tom Sizemore in the rain because all the sprinklers go off. I mean, it's like orchestrated chaos at this point. But how did that play? (laughs) The sparks flying and red lights going off just because, I mean, you know, you have to know it's an emergency, so we have to install red lights uh, for you in case shit goes down. 
Because otherwise, how would you know, Colin? Right. If things were going badly. And but this is also the thing that made me think of Die Hard, right? It was like this is going to be we you know locked everybody in, and you know we don't have terrorists, but we've got a monster. You know, oh shit! Didn't Peter Hyams direct uh, Sudden Death with Jean Claude Van Damme? Wasn't that, didn't he do two? Did movies? He? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Doesn't the hockey done, rink yeah. get locked down he, he in that, that one? That was locked down, yeah. Aha. Okay. <laughs> he did one in 2013 with Jean Claude Van Damme as well. Was that Universal Soldier? 14 or whatever no was. it was it was a different way different movie um i mean it could have been the same movie for all i know but a different title hmm. well it's good to know that he's still out there working with his pals yes um so mask hysteria happens tom sizemore our hero is set to try and more get... so than penelope ann miller see i don't know i think it's reversed <clears throat> i think penelope ann miller is actually the hero based on the climax of the movie and tom yeah, sizemore so becomes like what the fuck was he even in that movie for in the in the end? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what is the point of this character? I don't know. So the whole way through it, he's just kind of leading the uh, the investigation, right? Superstition, Colin. He's playing his best Bruce Willis. I'm going to hang on that. Like, every when he was acting, I'm like, he thinks he's in Die Hard also. Um, and... He has to get all the, the folks out of the museum, the mayor included. Of course, some people don't want to go. They get chomped. There's, uh, they call in the SWAT team. Ooh. who do SWAT team, helicopters, everything. I know. It's like epic. We got, you know, yeah. helicopters on Lakeshore <laughs> Drive. Yeah. <laughs> Guys fast roping down through skylights. Yeah. The, <laughs> and just getting eaten like in midair by the which Cthulhu, is, which is just right? jumping around all over the place. And jumping can walk on ceilings. People. And which which you, which led to which led to my favorite scene in this entire movie when the guy's hanging and gets bitten his bottom half gets bitten off and then the other guy's like no <laughs> yeah it, it cuts before but if you see him he freaks out and it's amazing <laughs> my favorite oh, no and the camera pulls way back the, yeah yes <laughs> my favorite was the guy that I don't know I admit I forget what how it started. But he got decapitated and his body fell onto like a bunch of arrows or spears pointing up and he got impaled and then just yeah. like kind of slowly slid down it a little bit. <laughs> and, that was that was and there was a lady like right there that saw the whole thing happen. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Yeah, they uh, they spared no expense in this portion of the film because, I mean, then it yeah. becomes, you know, Penelope Ann Miller's trapped inside with uh, James Whitmore from the Shawshank Redemption, right? He's in a wheelchair, and he's another professor. He really doesn't matter at all, except he helps her no. figure out the the big, the stunning reveal, the secret that the movie has been holding from its audience up until right. this moment, that DNA <laughs> will finally shaking her head. <laughs> unsolved. Michaela's going to tell us what it is and why it's important. I don't know if you can do both. The doctor in the cold open is the monster. What? Yeah, I know everybody's mouths what? are this hanging open right now. This is what was supposed to be the shocking twist. <laughs> Here's my question: Does it matter? No. <laughs> it it has no bearing on the plot. No, no. I mean, it's not like oh, we know it's John Whitney. John Whitney had asthma. We now know a way to kill this monster. It's like it, do- was- it really doesn't matter. No, when that was revealed, I was really worried that she was going to be like, I know how I can stop it. And was going to try and like talk him down like a mighty Joe Young situation. Yeah. I was really worried. That's what was where it was going to go. That is that was the stupidest fucking scene in this movie where she's like, I know who you are. Yes. So? It doesn't so matter. what? Yeah. Why is that monster all of a sudden being calm around her? Should have ate her ass. Well, see, this is, but this was an opportunity, I think, at a screenplay level that was completely missed. And that's why I wonder if there was something in the book or something like this, right? Because mm-hmm. what you want there, it's like the, the, the revelation that the creature is actually a mutated form of some character that you don't even know. They reference his name often through the movie, but I know nothing about this fucking guy. I don't have the... He's an asshole, apparently. Do do we even know that? I don't even know that. I think, or or they they don't... um, They think his his center of study is uh, frivolous and unimportant. I guess not even like I mean okay so maybe maybe you right even there you're giving me a little more like shading than I mean I have nothing except a physical (laughs) description of what the guy looks like in a pith helmet you know off in the jungle at the beginning of the movie I don't know anything about him there's a scene have any dialogue in his scene 
he said yeah, he something talks to the guy at the ship at the dock where he's like you can't let the oh. crates oh, get on yeah. the ship or whatever but that's it um but the, so this builds to i guess it's the climactic moment of the movie where you know sizemore has been locked out of the action penelope ann miller has to deal face to face with the creature the creature which has been just tearing through people left and right up until now comes up to her and as you guys said stops and stares at her a little while i'm like are we getting like an american werewolf in london moment here where like the thing recognizes her i don't know if they have a relationship i don't know and then it licks her it's big slimy yeah. fork tongue comes out and it licks her and right there i'm like okay this means nothing to me other than it's supposed to be an oogie moment it would have mm-hmm. meant something if like you know if this guy when she knew him if he was a you know an asshole like you said who had constantly hit on her, who right. she kept on spurning his advances, who didn't want to have anything to do with him. He kept on like, right. but then now as a monster form, he recognizes that this is the girl, you know, from before. And, you know, then the tongue licking has a different meaning. And then right. she kills him, you know, but it, without that, you're like, this doesn't fucking mean anything to me. <laughs> no, <laughs> it should just eat her. And she waits forever to call up the elevator behind her. She's like, it's a foot from her. And she's like, okay, I'm going to push the button now and try and escape. Because what was like, your plan is, there? What was the plan? What, this is like a one of those rickety old elevators, not like an actual elevator. Well, this it's, is their, this like is their alien scene. Like, yeah. this is what they want from this. She is Sigourney Weaver trying to get away from the alien and the elevator coming up behind her and all that stuff. This is what they're going for. Right. But they just draw it out uh, so long for whatever reason. Uh, uh, yeah, trying to. It did not type. earn this. No, not at all. No, it didn't. Yeah. Well, she has a big plan here. I mean, because uh, again, I'm not entirely sure what she was trying to do with that elevator. Like she was going to get away when she didn't call it beforehand. She's, you know, soaked the entire room in uh, alcohol or some kind of solvent or something like that, right? And she's going to burn All the chemicals them. that are keeping their specimens, yes. I also like that this kind of plays into that, like, hey, we researched the shit out of this, and this is, we're going to science the shit out of this, as, uh, as Matt Damon said in, in uh, The Martian, uh, because yeah. everyone else just has a lighter, a cigarette lighter, right? But not science nerds. No, science nerds have to pack a bunch of uh, things into a, a container and throw it, and that ignites and, and <laughs> blows up the room. But isn't that cooler? Come on. Well, yes, it's much cooler. <laughs> it is cooler. Impractical, <laughs> but cool. visually cooler. I also like the fact that this door to this lab has one of those like submarine uh, locks on it. You know, when you twist it and like the six uh, uh, pistons come out and lock it. So there's no way yeah. Tom Sizemore is getting back in this room. So, yeah. So the 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 cop character at this point is basically in the, the climax of the movie where we're in the showdown with the monster uh, is outside banging on the door to get in. Yeah. Right. Hello. Right. <laughs> open the door. Open the door at yeah. the top of his lungs. Did he actually he even it. have? Did he have a, a confrontation with the creature at some point in the in the in the cellars? Yes, uh, it's him, Penelope Ann Miller, and the guy in the wheelchair. Um, they meet up, I think, for the first time, and the monster comes back and is like running towards the door. Yeah. Oh, right. So they and slam like, the, the door and that? lock it. Yeah, and yeah. the monster bashes on the door for like five minutes. Yeah. And they're all very calm. That's right. Very calm. <laughs> very calm for a giant monster just attacking the shit out of everything. And very calm based on the way that we know that Penelope Ann Miller reacts to uh, death. Uh, the first yeah. time when she sees her beheaded uh, guard <laughs> friend, she like loses her fucking mind. That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> but then It was overly done. Yeah, because then when she sees James Whitmore, because he gets killed, and I assume she had a closer relationship with him, the reaction's a little more muted. <laughs> and it's like, mm-hmm. well, it's because she's seen all these other people get beheaded by now, so she's, yeah. you know, becoming inured to it or whatever. Yes. Um, so her method of... Uh, so but she's going to blow up the, the room with the creature in it. This, of course, starts the fire, and then the creature's running around on fire, like you said before. So I don't know if I heard, misheard a line of dialogue or something, right? But apparently they have these big vats, Full of fluid, which I have this question too, Colin. Okay, so what are these vats used for? The, uh, they were. This is where they're boiling animals before they put them in with the beetles that eat the flesh. 
Right. This is because they're trying to get them down to the bones, right? <clears throat> right. So I don't think there's any chemicals in there. I just think they're literally boiling them. Uh, okay. I took so, it as that there was a chemical. So that's just, you what think I was it's just water. Too. Yes, I think it's just water. I, I think there's flesh bits and shit in there, but yeah, full of I think it's fat. just water. Liquefied yeah. animal fat at this point, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's where she oh, hides. Fat liposuction out <laughs> of Marlon Brando's ass. <laughs> She hides in that to to survive yeah. the blast, which blows the creature up and uh, and destroys it. They are bo- thereby becoming the hero of the film. Right. She blew the fucking monster. Up. It's because she's got his lucky bullet. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. forgot about them. Yeah, tell there's us. a whole. Once oh, again, no. doesn't no. really matter. Yeah, we can't. There's a whole subplot of Tom Sizemore is very superstitious. The uh, exhibit they're opening up in the museum is called Superstition. Um, there's a whole thing about that. It's that's got to be one of the worst museum exhibits I think I've ever seen. It, it's absolutely terrible. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like you said, we'll put up some ladders and mirrors and <laughs> some umbrellas. Bunch of hanging yeah. umbrellas. You got to walk under the umbrellas. You got to walk under the ladders. Yeah, yeah. It's like oh. oh, okay. I don't know what. I mean, obviously, I think you know. You're right. They're trying to do some kind of tie-in that he's a super 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 superstitious cop. And the thing's called superstition, so he's going to have trouble wandering around there. But how that relates exactly to the plot of the movie, I don't know. It's just basically giving the character, uh, they're trying to give a three-dimensional shading to the cop character. Because beyond that, all we know is he's upset that his wife is getting custody of the dog in the divorce. (laughs) That joke was never funny, but they kept repeating it. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone, apparently everyone in Chicago knows knows about this. And there was no payoff. It was like the joke for the first 20 minutes and it was done. Right, because well, I he got, thought... He got the dog. The the other dog that yeah. he rescued from the sewer. Right, that was the I payoff. I think that's the payoff. The canine All or right. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He got to take that sure. dog home. There was actually a scene they cut to, like, you know, because the whole movie is basically, like I said, the aesthetic is, we're going to shoot it all in silhouette. Here's a guy with a dog walking down a tunnel, and I'm like, what the, who the fuck? I'm like, oh, it's got the dog, it's Tom Sizemore. I could not visually pick out who the hell that was. I had no. to put that together in my head, that, like, guy with dog is Tom Sizemore. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, what the guys who? earlier in the movie. Yeah. Wow. It's also a really long subplot of his partner trying to lead people through the sewers to next door, and we keep going back to them. Which we could have cut this whole thing out. Yeah. Like a couple, a couple people die, and it adds a few deaths to it. But man, they just cut back to it for a long time. Well, because they should have, in in order to, uh, you know, kind of simplify things, that should have been Tom Sizemore's character, right? Right. You just roll him and his partner into one guy. Yeah. Tom Sizemore is trying to lead people out of the building. You know, trying to rescue uh, Penelope Ann Miller who's stuck in the room. She can still kill the monster but he right. then rescues the mayor and everybody but that you don't makes sense. but without that then you're like what the fuck was he doing in this movie i don't know yeah <laughs> well you make a point yeah because he yeah he really could have just done that because she's running around doing not much with him yep. yeah all right was there a coda on this movie uh, a kicker at the end what do, what do we got here at the very end no again we're we're just in that era where they didn't put kickers on shit like this. Like so we get a close up of the claw and that's it. Yeah. Boom. Everybody, the people who live, yeah. live. No baby Godzilla's in this one. Yep. Those <laughs> who died, we mourn for them. Linda Hunt makes it out okay. We're very happy. Yeah, Linda she doesn't Hunt drown. Survives. That's right. She's <laughs> on her way to the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame because she was also yep. in Dune. Oh, uh, right. Dune. She's very good in Silverado also. I think she won an Oscar. Uh, that is why we uh, treasure did. the name of Linda Hunt. It was because I think in her first movie she won an Oscar, and I can't remember I think so. what it was called. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> we so, leave you on that question. Mark. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I tell you what, uh, listener, you're wondering whether or not we would recommend that you watch this movie called The Relic. Well, we're not going to tell you just yet. First of all, we're going to go around the, we're going to uh, answer some of your mail. And uh, in order to do that, we're going to need the assistance of our mailman. And his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. 
I can't see him. It's too dark. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think that your camera's up too high, Colin. I see oh, the yeah, top of just, his head. Wait, I see a few hairs. The little hand reaches oh, in. Yeah. and yeah, there you go. Uh, Colin, please, next time, just do that for our benefit. Because <laughs> if a little hand had just Wait. brought you the mail right now, I would have died. This is a visual thing, but I'm going to do it like... There you go. Oh, oh Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's, that's what I needed. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, the way that you can write into us, and we would love to hear from you, all you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Sat Freak Show. Or Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Sat Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or follow along on Instagram for the time of your life. Uh, about the relic, Robin Lineman Silverberg writes in and says, The book was better. And the movie totally left out probably one of the best book characters to come out of the last 50 years, Aloysius Zingu Lang Pendergrast, a Sherlock Jesus. Holmes for the new millennium. Okay. I thought Elizabeth Slander was the uh, Sherlock Holmes for the new millennium. Wasn't that Who? trilogy called Millennium? Elizabeth Slander? Oh, yeah. the, Dragon oh, yeah. okay. the millennium trilogy that never was. There you go. No, it happened. The three books happened. Then they kept making them after that. There's like six books now. Yeah, there's six. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Simon Carter said, I enjoyed this movie when I first saw it, but for years I had this in DNA with Mark DeCoscos mixed up. I was a teenager when I saw this in Species. Species had boobs. Guess which one I watched more. <laughs> <laughs> Fair yes. enough. <laughs> yes. Ironically, at the end of Species, they're in a bunch of catacombs, and it's a CGI beastie running around, there's fire and all that. They just they yeah. ended a movie in the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, Teresa Ann says, ooh, great choice. Sure to be a fun episode. Uh, Ryan Handsome Jansen writes in and says, you're in for a few people being decapitated so their hypothalamus can be nibbled on. Very true. And uh, B-Movie Poster Vault says, the relic, have I seen it? According to Letterbox, yes, in 2015 as a double feature with a Cuban <laughs> comedy horror movie, Juan of the Dead. Did I like it? Apparently, yes, as I rated it four out of five stars. Can I remember Damn. a single thing about it five years later? No. No, nope. I can't. Guess it's time to go <laughs> dig that flick out again, and I hope I didn't have any plans for right now. <laughs> That's what Letterbox is good for, remembering <laughs> things you forgot yeah. you've seen. Did I watch this movie? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, no, you don't have any plans right now. Boom. <laughs> there no. you go. Uh, <laughs> you can't use the excuse you're busy anymore. Um, about last week's movie, which was Tourist Trap, Bill Hainer writes in and said, uh, that movie had a really odd soundtrack. Weird, inappropriate, and cartoony. I found it rather distracting. A little bit. Yeah. I can see that. Oh, you were not a fan of it, Holly? I can't remember how we came down on it last week. No, I, I agree that it was really weird. I, but I think it added to the creep factor. Yeah. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, about uh, the previous week's movie, Final Destination 3, Jolo Holo writes in. Jolo Hoho, sorry. And thank you very oh. much for the uh, five-star review on iTunes. Jolo oh, Hoho like, oh. said, this was a frustrating episode for me. First, the girls are putting down Mary Elizabeth Winstead's acting, and then the guys took this movie way too serious. It's a movie you just sit back and enjoy the ride. I agree. I agree. It is the movie you sit back in each other. Yeah. But I, I stand by that she's a boring actress. Ouch. <laughs> Jesus. Holy God. Sorry. I'm not saying she's bad. I just don't remember. Yeah, I that's what I mean. Remember. She's, she's forgettable. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> go back and listen to our final destination. So we're all standing by our positions yep. on that yes. episode. Again. Yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> C.J. Lewis writes in and says, in a film series with absurd off the wall deaths and overall premise. I feel like three in particular was the start of the MTV Freddy era in this franchise, and that's a low bar. Keep up the good work, guys, and please stay healthy. Well, that you. is that We're is trying. a good comparison for it. I think that's fair. <laughs> uh, Grant Parrish says I think the origin of the 180 in the Final Destination series is that if you keep going. The way you're going, death will get you, so you have to pull a 180 and turn your life around. I love it. <laughs> Send me more of your Final Destination <laughs> theories, audience. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> Nelson Nachiment- Nachimento says uh, that three is a couple steps down from the first two, but is that bad? Not really. Still highly enjoyable despite its faults. Actually, I might be in the minority, but I feel this entire franchise is underrated. I agree. Probably. It's obviously. Fun. It's fun. Uh, Michaela on that episode said you were basically either a Saw person or a Final Destination person back when these were coming out. Dan Dunn said Saw definitely got played out. I mean, they put out seven sequels. I stopped watching them after maybe four, so I guess I can't talk shit. But they're, if they're amazing, let me know and I'll watch them. I've never seen past three. Neither have I. Or I've seen them all. Are they amazing? Of course you have. I don't know if I'd say that. I did like, uh, I like the first three, and I like, uh, I think it was five. Isn't that the one with the real estate thing that was going on? And uh, that one I kind of like. Um, real estate thing? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, they were all, like, all the people who are in the trap, like, had this, they were basically defrauded somebody, and so they were all bad. So then he got them all and put them on. But that one actually, like, worked this out pretty part, good. Part five's a real estate scam movie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy. Is this, like, a response to the housing crisis yes. of 2008? Yeah. Oh. oh, Jesus. Yep. Uh, I didn't uh, realize those movies got deep. It's like, it's like, I want to play a game. You have $15,000 in back taxes. Will you kill the man next to you? Yeah. Michaela, 401k just took a nosedive. <laughs> yeah. Michaela, this is our chance to make our multi-level marketing horror movie. <laughs> yeah. That, well, we haven't seen we haven't seen Spiral from the Book of Saw yet, so there's still hope. True. Uh, I was Nick, just thinking if that really is the premise of that movie, maybe I'll write some bullshit think piece about it and get published. <laughs> there you go. I think you could. <laughs> uh, Nick Destro says, I was a Saw guy. I think I only saw the original Final Destination. Mm. Uh, Neil Gums said he was a fan of both, but I revisit all of the Final Destinations way more frequently. The original Saw is the only one of those I come back to anymore. Uh, Life with Kenny Pod. I wonder if that's supposed to be the Life with Kenny podcast. Maybe. Life with Kenny Pod says it's up there with the House of Wax remake for underrated, is it B-horror, but still entertaining as hell movies from the early to mid thousands. Saw was great and revolutionary for mainstream body horror, but the Final Destination series kept people off planes and roller coasters for years. Ha ha. There you go. I agree. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't rewatched a single Saw movie though, so maybe I should. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's like it, you, you got to give it like uh, what about almost twenty years, and then you go back and revisit them. I did it a little mm-hmm. earlier than that. They came out with like an eight film set, so that was when I was like, okay, I saw all those Saw movies. And the problem with when you're watching them in the theater is I go in every year and go like, I can't remember what the fuck happened last year. And then yeah. I don't know where I am on these. But when you watch them in a marathon, you're like, oh, I can follow the story. And it gets more and more preposterous as it goes. But they are making references back. Like that fucking huh. thing gets super goddamn crazy complicated where you're like, I admire the weight, the heavy lifting that each writing team had to do to try and, well, I suppose like they do that in Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street. Like we killed them at the end. What are you going to do? I'm going to figure right. out some way. Yeah. Uh, Tammy you don't Green. You have that problem in Final Destination. That's right. You just start over <laughs> each time. Uh, Tammy Grinzinger says she likes both the series. Andrew Bradford says uh, for his favorite kills in the Final Destination series, he liked the gym- gymnastics scene in part five and the pool scene in part four. <clears throat> that pool scene in part four. Did you ever read? I don't remember that one. I remember the ju- the car wash. I don't remember. But I don't the, remember the pool. I think the cool pool scene, if I remember it, I may be getting it confused with a Chuck Palahniuk novel that I read, which I think they ripped it off. Guts. But no, it was. Oh, I uh, do remember. Haunted, what was it haunted or something? Yeah, like that? the story was guts in in the book haunted. Yeah, where the guy gets yeah. like he gets his inside sucked out through a, the suction at the bottom the of a. a yeah. I think yeah, that's nice. what happens in Final Destination Four. Yeah. Because the yeah. guts, I remember, comes like shooting out yeah. of a, a vent hose or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That um, story, that Chuck Palahniuk story is disgusting. It's Everyone disgusting. should read it. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, got levels of disgusting. What is that book called? Haunted. It's Haunted. a bunch okay. of short stories, but the short story is guts. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gary Lee comes to Mary Elizabeth Winstead's defense, says she's fantastic in a movie called All About Nina. It's a straight drama. And she gives an amazing performance as an alcoholic comedian dealing with her past sexual assault and starting a new relationship. It's on Netflix, and I strongly recommend it. Wow, that sounds happy. 
What was it called? Mm-hmm. Uh, All About Nina. Sean's oh, yeah, I've heard about that. Um, and Ben Harris says, uh, hey, guys, seeing we're all in quarantine, I've been watching some movies. I just saw a movie called Warning Sign from 1985. It's definitely worth bringing it to the freak show. Think 28 days later, but in a lab. It's on the list. I know. I've always wanted to see Warning Sign. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't I think uh, didn't Shop Factory put that out? I think so. I think, I think they so. Were putting out, like, yeah. But that was one of those movies that. Back in my day, it was an HBO staple. I didn't have HBO, but I knew it was on because I collected the guides. <laughs> awesome. Remember those little paper guides the HBO used to send every month? You, you guys don't remember this. There was a little I booklet. remember TV guide. I got a in TV color. guide, but... Yeah, no, yeah. they used to send out to their subscribers this little full-color thing. Oh, man, now, now I want to go look those up on eBay. Okay, so uh, <laughs> do we or do we not <clears throat> recommend tonight's movie, The Relic? We're going to go around the room virtually and start with Colin. Yeah, Sean. What did you think of The Relic? Well, it's a tough one because, um, you know, as I'm sitting here and I'm cataloging all of the stuff that's wrong with this movie. <laughs> Right. This is my because I am trying to still I I had my mind made up before I sat down tonight. And as I'm sitting here and you're kind of reliving it, I'm like, there is some things that I like. I mean, I like the fact that it's a monster movie with a fucking monster in it. You get to see the monster. The monster is jumping all over the place. It's an active monster. I like that they keep it off screen for a while to kind of build suspense as to what the monster is going to be. Um. And the monster does behead like a whole fucking shitload of people. I mean, that's these are in the positive uh, categories. But right. I think these are things you want. I think my biggest gateway, or the roadblock, right, to me recommending this movie. I seriously, I'm going to say that this is this is this is the thing. I couldn't fucking see it. Um, (laughs) it was just such an ugly like offensively ugly movie it is there are two movies that i can think of where they tried to use darkness in this way uh as an aesthetic choice and both of them are like i don't remember shit about them after i see them because i didn't see it uh there's this in alien versus predator requiem the second one uh uh, which was i think um what's marcus misbells yeah but Marcus Nispel's uh, cinematographer, Daniel Pearl. Daniel right? Pearl. He shot it. So I'm like, ooh, Daniel Pearl shot it. And then you watch it and you're like, what are you? This, like he was pursuing an aesthetic with Texas Chainsaw and Pathfinder and all that that finally got him to the like, what if we don't turn any lights on at all? <laughs> An alien is a black thing against a black background, and it's in a suit. I'm like, I'm, okay, I give up. I can't see it. Couldn't see the Predator either. But so there's these two movies, the Relic and that one. And uh, yeah, I actually I do not like that stylistic choice so much that so that's number one. I can't get past that. I can't say go see this movie because you're not going to be able to see the goddamn movie. Uh, number two. Um, yeah, I guess when you look at it from like, okay, well, does it function as a movie? At least does it have a compelling storyline? Do you follow it? Do you know what's going on? It's like the structure of this thing's broken. Um, the director is trying to, and this is a thing, I guess, you know, I guess it's why you don't know Peter Hyam's name as a household name, even though the guy's been working for like 40 years or something like that, yeah. maybe more, 50 years, um, is because... And I think 2010 is probably when you, you Google him, that's probably going to be the one, you know, that people remember him for the most, but, uh, um, his style, at least in this, and I think it's born out in his late nineties and two thousands era stuff is, uh, all this cross cutting to make it seem like something furious is happening. As far as action, we've got characters yelling at the top of their lungs when they don't really need to be Right. The guy is in a room, like leading people down a hallway, and he's yelling like he, that he's screaming at people uh, ten blocks away or something. I I love that he screams like, "All right, we're gonna go quick. We're gonna be quiet. We're gonna stick together." <laughs> and then for the rest of the movie, they are yelling as they try and get away from this monster. Yeah, I mean, so it's basically it's a directorial you know flourish when you don't have I don't think the confidence in your material and you're trying to boost it up and jazz it up somehow you're jazzing it up through this kind of style, which is like you're doing it in editing because the thing is, and actually if we just played it out as normal, it's not going to work at all. It's not the, you know, so, uh, 
and again, I don't think that any of the characters really make any kind of impression, except maybe Penelope Ann Miller. I do. Re- I remembered her from before, and I remember, her, you know, having just watched it. I'm like, she makes the biggest impression. Sizemore, I suppose, makes an impression, but I can't remember anything about him because ultimately his character is pointless and se- doesn't need to be in the movie. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on the relic. I don't think that uh, you need to go see it if you haven't seen it already even if you're i mean only maybe if you're a monster movie completionist um but yeah i'm gonna pass on the relic uh holly what do you think (laughs) (laughs) yeah no colin i think i'm in total agreement with you on this one i was i was on the fence because there are some things about this movie i do enjoy um i really do like the monster design i think it's really cool and um and the CGI for 1997 really isn't all that bad. Like, it's not great, but it's not. I've seen much worse. Like, yeah, Sean said earlier, I've seen much worse. This is like the yeah. same year as Escape from L.A., just, you know, for comparison. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did, yeah. Didn't it have that have the shark shot underwater or something yeah. like that yeah. that we groaned out loud at? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that might have been the in 98, surfing. but yeah, in 96. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So good. So, so, yeah, like, I like the monster a lot. I think it's really cool. Um, and I would... I'm not really bored during this movie. Like it's, it's got my attention enough that it didn't really lose me. However, I totally agree with what you're saying. Like the story has no structure. Like every, you know, Michaela said earlier that everything in this movie is inconsequential. And that's so true. Like you can't follow what's going to count later and what doesn't really matter. And, um, there's so many, there's so many side things that just don't ever come to fruition. Like there's really no point to the kids and there's, there's so many weird things like that. And, it is kind of hard to follow. You know, obviously we all had questions coming into it. Like when did this happen or why did this happen? And there shouldn't be that many questions. So I I agree with you that there's more not to like than there is to like, because we've already said at this movie, you can't see a fucking thing. Like it's, it's too much. I mean, I, I, I appreciate a few silhouette shots, but you can't make an entire movie like that, especially with close ups. You can't see anything. If, you know, I, I agree with Colin, what you said about waiting to show the monster, you know, you have that suspense effect and it, it works to an extent, but when you really can't see anything for that long, I, I just, I just can't bring myself to recommend it because you can't see shit. Um, yeah, I, I really do like parts of it. I remember watching this a lot as a kid and I really like this movie, but watching it now, I'm just like, yeah, there's, there's two there's too much you can't see and too much that doesn't make sense. I, I can't in good conscience recommend it, even though it's a cool monster. And I agree with you. If if you are a monster movie enthusiast, you, sh- you might want to check it out just for the design. But I can't recommend The Relic. Michaela? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you guys are saying. I This movie has no business being almost two hours long. It's just not necessary. This movie, like... The plot is needlessly, I don't even want to say complicated because it's not really that complicated, but it just adds things to it that don't need to be there. It's a monster movie. We we know what we're getting in for. We know all the major beats it's going to hit. You don't need to add all this extra like nerdy science jargony scenes just for the sake of having them. And like the twist, I guess, is kind of cool, but it's also it's a, it still doesn't matter. It, it still it doesn't help them defeat the monster. It doesn't have any consequence of the story whatsoever. So it really does not matter. And I just the monster is so cool, and you do get to see it a lot, and it is well crafted. So that part, I'm like, oh, maybe I should, but like I did not enjoy the movie until that point. Yeah. Um, because I just kept felt like its wheels were spinning and I was just waiting for it to get started. And it just, it feels amateurish in so many ways, but then yet you, you know, you've got this amazing like Stan Winston type creature. I don't think I can recommend it because you just have to get through so much to get to where it's cool that I don't know if it's worth it. So I don't think I can recommend it. Sean. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think you guys are all pretty much, uh, you know, hitting the nail on the head with this movie. Um, I used to watch it a lot, a ton, when I was younger. Uh, HBO rentals, all that shit. Um, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. Um, like we said, because the major reason the monster is so very good. Um, I think it's a great design, and I think it's utilized pretty well, and it's a fun thing. But there is a lot to chew through before you get to that stuff in this movie. Like, there's a lot of fat in this movie. 
there is a simpler version of this whole thing um, that could have been made. Uh, like everyone's saying, there's good parts, but man, does it take a long time to get there? Um, I appreciate the monster. I appreciate how um, I appreciate how gory it is. I was surprised, and uh, and I'm not kidding when there's I say there's 25 beheadings in this movie. It's insane. It's a lot. Um, yeah, so many. Um, but there's just like we said, there's a lot of inconsequential stuff in this movie. And it kind of leaves you wondering, like, okay, what was, you know, what was the point of this? What was the point of this? And there's way too much of that um, to be able to recommend this movie. If I went on nostalgia alone, I could probably be like, of course, yeah, it's fun. But um, there's, uh, it got beaten down by everything else in the movie. Again, uh, check out the scenes with the monster if you love monsters, because I love monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a major yeah. reason I picked this one. So, like, go check out the monster. But other than that, uh, the relic doesn't quite make it. It's one of those from you know my uh, childhood that doesn't hold up with adult eyes. So, unfortunately, I have to pass on the relic. All right. Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's four four passes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Universal. Yeah, avoid the relic. <clears throat> Well, it's too bad, right? Well, you know. It is, you're right. Don't you kind of feel bad about it? I do. I do. It's, like, yeah, it's like, it's too bad. bad. It's like, it's uh, bad. it also it reminded me in some ways, I don't know why I was watching it, of like Lake Placid or something. It's like these movies from that era where they, I don't know. Yeah, it's just, this is goes another with, one where there's two of them. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, next week we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by Holly. Thank you for making the face, Holly. I was confused. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, Holly, what will we be watching next week? Next week, we're going to watch a little gem called Bad Taste. Oh, oh no. shit. Right. Uh, Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson, yeah. Okay, all right. This is a weird movie. This, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because this movie looks like it tastes bad. So it's, that's... <laughs> that's gross. <laughs> it looks gross. <laughs> well, all right so join us for bad taste next week on the saturday night freak show and until then boils and ghouls the basements plural are going dark <laughs> <laughs>